Assalamu alaikum. This is the third and final part of the carbohydrates lecture. And in this lecture, we'll be talking about um, polysaccharides. So what are polysaccharides? So basically, uh, they are polymers uh, composed of many, many, many residues of sugar molecules. Um, we're talking about hundreds to thousands. And um, some of these polysaccharides can have the same exact residue. And they are known as homopolysaccharides. And some of them contain different types of residues. And they are called heteropolysaccharides. Now, whenever you look at a polysaccharide, you need to look at certain features. And these include the monosaccharides, the residues, the monosaccharides that make up these polysaccharides. You need to look at the length of this polysaccharide branching, whether it is a straight molecule or it is branched molecule, and how extensive the branching is. And you can also look at the function of these polysaccharides, and they are in general divided into two categories or two types. They can either be considered storage polysaccharides used for production of energy, and these include glycogen, starch, and dextran, or they can be structural polysaccharides, so they make up uh, tough structures such as cellulose, pectin, and chitin. Let's start with the first one, glycogen. Glycogen is a storage polysaccharide in animals and in humans as well. So what you see in here, and, and the, the main storage organ is liver. So here, what you see is an electron microscopy image of a liver cell containing all of these glycogen molecules shown as black dots. Okay, so each black dot actually looks something like this. It contains a lot of glucose residues. Uh, so this is like you zoom into the uh, the glycogen molecule, and that's how it looks like. Okay, so it's mainly composed of glucose residues. So that's the building block. That's one. Two. Note the connection between the residues. So it is an alpha one to four okay, glycosidic bond. Alpha, 1, 4, alpha, 1, 4, and so on. And there is a branching point, and the branch takes place between carbons number 1 and carbon number 6. So it is, again, an alpha, 1, 6 glycosidic bond. And it is a highly branched molecule, as you can see in this uh, illustration. Okay. Uh, and by the way, uh, following the branch, you look at these, uh, it, it continues as a straight line with an alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. So it's only the branching point where uh, the, the uh, bonding pattern, the glycosidic bond, is alpha-1,6. Well, in plants, the storage molecule is starch. And it exists in two forms either as an amylose or amylopectin. The majority of starch exists as an amylopectin molecule. You look at the structure of amylopectin, uh, sorry, amylose and amylopectin. So you look at amylose, it's mainly a straight molecule. It is not a branched molecule, okay? having a bond, a glycosidic bond between one, four, and also it is in the alpha uh, form. The anomeric uh, carbon is in the alpha form. So it's alpha 1, 4, alpha 1, 4, alpha 1, 4, and so on. Amylopectin, the, the, uh, the predominant form of starch, also is also made of glucose monomers, just like glycogen and just like amylose. And the bonding pattern is very similar to glycogen. 
So you have an alpha 1,4, alpha 1,4, alpha 1,4, and there's also a branch. And the branching point is formed by a glycosidic bond between carbons number one, the anomeric carbon, with carbon number six, just like glycogen as well. And this is an illustration of how starch or amylopectin looks like. So it is a branch molecule, but note that the branching pattern of amylopectin is less extensive than glycogen. Okay, now, when, when amylopectin or amylose are, uh, are uh, when, when these forms, when these molecules are degraded, they are degraded into uh, simpler molecules. Uh, including maltose, which is made of two glucose. It's a disaccharide made of two glucose monomers as well as um, glucose, um, the final uh, product. So there are differences and similarities between glycogen and amylopectin. Both of them are made of the, from the same monomer, glucose, and both are branched. Now, glycogen exists in animals and amylopectin exists in plants. Both of them are storage molecules, meaning that they are mainly used for energy purposes. Okay. Now, glycogen is different in being more branched than amylopectin. So, so there is a branching point for every 10 residues in glycogen versus 25 residues in amylopectin. Now, the, the question is, why is it that branching is important? Well, one, it makes, it, it makes the molecule more water soluble and it does not crystallize. Now, the thing is, in amylopectin, it exists in plants and plant cells in general have a lot of water. So there is no need for branching to be as extensive as glycogen, which exists in animal cells, which do not normally contain a lot of water. So it has to be more branched to become more water soluble. Okay. The other thing is that um, a glycogen is more branched to make it easier for enzymes to access glucose residues. Okay. So more glucose residues can be uh, released from glycogen to generate more energy. So that's more needed in animal cells versus uh, plant cells. Okay. The uh, another molecule that is also used as a storage polysaccharide and it mainly exists in yeast and bacteria is known as dextran. Dextran is also a homopolysaccharide, just like glycogen and starch. So it's mainly made of just glucose residues. And it is a highly branched molecule. And it, it differs in having the main chain ex exist in um, a, the glycosidic bond between the residues is alpha 1, 6. So so the main chain is alpha 1, 6. This, this is a chain. This is another chain as well. Okay, so it's alpha 1, 6. Now the branching points are variable. They can be uh, 1, 2, 1, 3, or 1, 4. So there is a variety in the formation of the strand molecule. Well, how about cellulose? Well, cellulose is also a homopolysaccharide. So it's mainly made of glucose residues as well. So each one of these is a glucose residue. The difference between cellulose and glycogen or starch is that the glycosidic bond is in the beta 1,4 form. And the reason is, why is it in the beta configuration? And the answer is, if it is in the alpha configuration, the bond is flexible and it can be bent. So if you look back into the structure of glycogen and starch, you would notice that these two molecules are highly branched, amylopectin specifically. Okay. The reason is that 
now the alpha subunit is in the uh, it, it can bend it can be bent on the other hand the beta glycosidic linkage cannot be bent creating a straight chain molecule that is not really branched and what happens is that uh, the you have these chains that line up on top of each other and there is extensive hydrogen bonding taking place between these chains creating really strong structure and this beta glycosidic bond is actually a rigid bond so the whole molecule is really a rigid molecule as you would expect from a a structure like cellulose it's a structural molecule that creates the stem of plants for example okay so you do need this structure to be rigid and this rigidity is facilitated by the beta glycosidic linkage so well how about chitin chitin is a um, a, a homopolysaccharide that is made of N-acetyl beta D glucose amine. Remember, we talked about this molecule in the first part of carbohydrates lecture. So you see this molecule, you have an amino group and then it is acetylated. Okay, so this is the N-acetyl beta because you look at the anomeric carbon, the hydroxyl group is going upward, so it is a beta D glucose amine. So you have this linkage of the N-acetyl beta glucose amine uh, between the different residues. Note that the glycosidic bond is also in the beta configuration. So notice that beta 1, 4, beta 1, 4. Again, because it is in the beta configuration, the molecule is not, cannot be bent. Okay. Rather, it exists as a straight line, a straight chain. And because you have an acetyl groove and you have the hydrogen, you have even more extensive hydrogen bonding within these molecules, creating a very rigid structure, as such as the exoskeleton of some uh, organisms, um, like cockroaches, for example. And that's why you know, when you step on a cockroach, what happens? You hear this um, noise, right? Disgusting, huh? Well, that's chitin. So next time you kill a cockroach, well, you know it's chitin. And you know that you got this from me. Another polysaccharide is pectin, which exists in plant cells as well. Uh, along with cellulose and this pectin um, is made of galactoronic acid so you look at this molecule right here notice the hydroxyl group of carbon number two it's below the ring number three above the ring and number four it's above the ring so it is galactose and it's modified it is a sugar acid so it's known as galactoronic acid, which can also be modified by a methyl group. Okay. Notice that the bond in here is alpha 1, 4, glycosidic bond. So, um, and, and pectin can be used in food industry a lot as well. Okay. So it exists in plant cell walls. Now, the question is, are polysaccharides reducing sugars? And the answer is no. Even though there are um, free anomeric carbons, overall, they are not enough to make the molecule a reducing sugar. Okay? So it's not considered, so polysaccharides are not considered reducing sugars. Now, sometimes uh, you can have the sugar molecules or the, the monosaccharides, they can be modified 
they can be modified in, uh, into sugar acids, for example, into sugar alcohols, as you can see in here, they can be converted into amino groups and so on. And you can have also the addition of sulfate groups. Now, there, there are main components of large structures known as glycosaminoglycans. So these are sugar molecules that contain amino groups. Okay. And they are large molecules because they are made of repetitive disaccharides. So you look at, for example, heparin, for example. Okay. Heparin is an anticoagulant. It prevents the coagulation of blood. So you see here, it is a molecule that contains an amino group right here. And these two molecules, these two residues are, or disaccharides are repeated over and over and over again. Now, all of these different glycosaminoglycans are negatively charged. So you look at it, they are negatively charged. Okay, now they contain amine groups, some of them contain sulfate groups. And they, these molecules are extracellular. Okay, so they, they exist outside the cells, in the connective tissues. Examples include hyaluronate, keratin sulfate, heparin, dermatin sulfate, chondroitin 4 sulfate, and 6 sulfate. Okay, so there are different types. You are not um, obliged to memorize the structures of all of these molecules or the components. Okay, so you don't have to memorize, for example, that heparin is composed of glucuronate 2 sulfate and um, sulfur glucosamine 6 sulfate. You don't have to memorize this. You just need to know that that the names like heparin, chondroitin 4 sulfate, and so on that these are known as glycosaminoglycans and their main characteristics. That is, they are negatively charged, they contain amino groups, and so and they exist in the, uh, 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 they, they exist extracellular. So uh, these are examples again of glycosaminoglycans like hyaluronate. Hyaluronate is found in the extracellular matrix in connective tissues as well as in uh, synovial fluids. Chondroitin sulfate uh, is found in cartilage uh, and it is the most abundant glycosaminoglycan. Now hyaluronate is a lubricant fluid. Okay, it's shock absorbing. Now think about this something like chondroitin sulfate it's highly charged molecule large uh, repeats of, uh, of of all of these disaccharides so and cartilage exists in your knees for example protecting uh, uh, bones from uh, hitting each other reducing friction of bones so when you jump and you land on your feet what happens is that there is compression the, uh, um, on the cartilage uh, pressing on the cartilage now when your leg is relaxed because of all of the negative charges that exist in chondroitin sulfate there is repulsion so these molecules get separated from each other They're, they they get away from each other inflating back again okay so um, heparin is an anticoagulant that exists in our blood now uh, if we go back to to hyaluronate and chondroitin sulfate uh, these are sold in pharmacies uh, as pills by the way and the claim is that they protect uh, the knees of older people. So older people who have problems with their knees, they tend to, to, to uh, take hyaluronate and chondroitin sulfate. Okay, but actually this is actually great marketing, a great industry, money making industry, except that there is no claim, there is no proof that they benefit people. Simple.
if you take hyaluronate chondroitin sulfate if they get into your stomach they or, or and intestines they would be cleaved they would be metabolized so um, it's not like um, uh, they would reach cells in their final form hyaluronate or chondroitin sulfate now you can have structures known as proteoglycans which are basically made, made of glycose aminoglycans associated with proteins or peptides except that the major component is the glycose aminoglycan and you have some peptides or protein parts okay now these proteoglycans are uh, mainly lubricants they are structural components in the connective tissue they mediate adhesion of cells meaning that let's we can assume that if you have a cell connecting with part of a proteoglycan and you have another cell connected to another part of a proteoglycan uh, these two cells can transmit signals to each other via the proteoglycan okay and these proteoglycans that exist in the extracellular matrix can also be considered as storage places of uh, small molecules like hormones, ligands, nutrients, and so on. And these can be released uh, slowly from the proteoglycan to the cells. Now, an example of peptidoglycans um, are um, molecules that exist in the cell wall of bacteria. Now, the cell wall of bacteria is made of mainly proteoglycans or peptidoglycans and the glycans are made of two of these sugars the n-acetylmuramic acid and the n-acetylglucose amine so that's how they look like now the n-acetylglucose amine is simple right because you have an amino group and then you have the acetyl group uh, associated with it now the n-acetylmuramic acid is a little more complex not only that it contains the acid the amino the acetyl group connected to the amino group it also contains a lactic acid okay now so the the proteoglycan is made of these repeated subunits of disaccharides of these two disaccharides and then you have a so you have the the n-acetylmuramic acid n-acetylglucose amine n-acetylmuramic acid n-acetylglucose amine and so on uh, shown as balls large balls and then you have amino acids extended from these two sugars and these amino acids can be connected to each other so you have a cell wall a tough cell wall to break and to penetrate so it looks something like this in addition to these disaccharides right you have can you have a, a number of amino acids connected to each other and you have another uh, a, a branching point as well um, of these amino acids and that's how they are connected to each other now you do not have to memorize these amino acids by the way just get the idea so then you have molecules known as glycoproteins now they differ from proteoglycans uh, in terms of the ratio of sugar to protein in proteoglycans the majority of the molecule is a glycose aminoglycan with some proteins or some peptides on the other hand glycoproteins the majority of structure is a protein with some sugars now these sugars can be attached to amino acids of proteins via two linkages either n-glycosidic linkage or o-glycosidic linkage the difference is with the n-glycosidic linkage now you have a glycosidic bond with an amino group of an amino acid known as asparagine now the o-glycosidic linkage is you have a glycosidic bond with the anomeric carbon uh, between the anomeric carbon with the hydroxyl group of an amino acid known as serine or an amino acid known as threonine and in some cases 
you have another modified amino acid known as hydroxylysine and you will learn about this in the collagen lecture okay now these sugars that decorate proteins are important for a number of purposes so these sugars are important for protein folding that is for a protein to get into its final shape final structure now these sugars are also important in protein targeting so you learned in cell biology you have lysosomal proteins that uh, must have a mannose group attached to them so that they can be targeted to uh, lysosomes now sugars can also prolong protein half-life so you have a certain protein with a half-life of about 20 days if it is glycosylated if it is not glycosylated its half-life would be only 30 minutes so you can imagine the effect of uh, these sugar molecules now sugars are important as well for cell cell communication now pay attention that these sugar molecules exist on the cell surface of proteins or on on cell surface proteins outside of the cell not inside the cell and you can have sugars like inositol for example involved in signaling inside cells now these sugars can make proteins more soluble as well now modification of proteins on the cell surface of red blood cells is important for blood typing so you learned uh, probably in school that there are uh, four different blood types you have a b a b or o now the difference between these different blood types is actually the sugars that are associated with proteins on the cell surface of red blood cells so right here you have an o antigen okay having the sequence of um, uh, sugars associated with the cell surface which is right here so you have galactose uh, uh, n-acetyl glucose amine you have galactose and then you have fucose we talked about fucose before right now the a antigen it has the same sequence except that it has an additional sugar the uh, n-acetyl galactose amine how about the b antigen it has an extra sugar uh, compared to the o antigen which is a galactose okay so this is why someone with an o antigen can donate blood to anyone else including someone with the a, a blood type or the b blood type because they all have the same sequence but someone with an a antigen okay cannot donate uh, blood to someone with a b blood type or an o blood type because uh, it has a different sugar moiety same thing with the b antigen someone with an a b antigen cannot donate to anyone any of them except it can it can be a recipient from anyone okay so this is the reason uh, why now finally we have a sugar molecule known as uh, sialic acid which is also known as n-acetyl neuraminic acid or neuraminate this is how it looks like so it is an amino sugar right here and uh, there's an acetyl group associated with it and it is a sugar acid so you can see all of these modifications uh, you don't you don't have to memorize this structure by the way just the features okay so it is a negatively charged um, uh, um, sugar acid and mainly what you really need to know is that it exists as the final sugar in a sequence of sugars attached to a protein so right here you can have you, you can see different types of uh, glycoproteins and you have a sequence of sugars um, added as a chain and the very last one in red is sialic acid 
Okay, so it exists as the as the terminal residue of an oligosaccharide chain of glycoproteins as well as glycolipids, and we will talk about glycolipids in the next lecture. Allah